this is where my childhood was taken. This is where my security, my safety, my trust. This is like where my blood, my sweat, and my tears bled into this ground. We were going roller skating, yeah. I mean, I remember when we passed the roller rink, I said, where, where are we going? And they were like, oh, we're just gonna go hang out for a little bit. This was the first time that I was ever allowed to go roller skating at night. I was a little kid and I looked like a little kid, you know, my freckles are on my face. There was no makeup. I wasn't trying to be something I wasn't at that age. And I was in the back seat and this, my rapist was sitting next to me, but not next to me because there was this big red cooler separating us. Like, I just don't understand how someone in their 20s sees a little kid as sexual. I remember her handing me like this big can and I just started chugging it. And I just kept drinking. And they kept handing them to me and I kept drinking. And then everything went black. I remember coming in that door after they dropped me off down the street and the police were here, there was a cop here, dad was here and mom was there. But I remember mom coming over to, to me and I was just covered in dirt and she just smacked me so hard across the face. And you were both here, I do remember that because I remember you just running and going under your top bunk and crying. Then I remember pop grabbing this phone and walk, taking, we had a really long cord. Remember how long that cord was? Yeah. And he walked all the way over to that door and then I start, he started crying because that was the first time I ever saw him cry. I remember that like it was yesterday. Coming to on this, in this place in the middle of the night, having some old man inside me, it was just painful and confusing. And I lived in that pain and that confusion for a really, really, really long time. And so I desperately needed to not feel it. And so alcohol and drugs were what, they just quieted it. They smoothed the edges and they made me numb. Unfortunately, a girl that would present like I presented back then today will pr would probably get put in a psych ward as well. No, there no. isn't a place to put sexual assault survivors that is caring and, and comforting and trauma informed. It's like I remember one time mom finding my poetry because after that I, would, I couldn't sleep. And I remember mom finding one particular poem that I wrote and saying, do you need to go back to the hospital? And that, of course, shut me right down because I was like, that's the last place I want to go mm -hmm. back to. Who wants to go there? It was that freaking place they had me in that did nothing for me for an entire summer. Just, so I just shut down. There was, I wasn't going to give her anything else. with medication. It was horrific where I was. There was nothing comforting or, or, or good about it. And I was like, I, where am I? Like, what am I doing? Mm. And then my roommate was in the shower just cutting her stomach open, blood everywhere. <sighs> She's the one that taught me how to cut. I mean, I wasn't cutting until I came home. What, your roommate? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where I learned it. Hmm. It's what she did. It was what she did in the bathroom. I thought, well, maybe that'll work. Sexual violence penetrates every aspect of who you are. It's a violation on so many different levels of your body, of your spirit, of your mind, of your memories, of your reality in some ways. And the shame and the guilt are so thick. They're so thick. This is when I became a daily crackhead, like daily, daily for real, when I moved in here. And we were smoking crack in the back. And it didn't matter how many drugs there were, it didn't matter how much alcohol there was, nothing concealed that pain, nothing. <laughs> My life was going nowhere, and I had no hope. I didn't think I could get out of it. And I went into the kitchen, and I grabbed the Sky Vodka, and I went in my bedroom, and I just started to just brutally slice my wrists. We kicked down the door, and um, you were laying there with pictures all around you. And I could see the blood. You had a, there was a crack pipe right next to your head. And um, for me, it was just, I thought you were dead at first. I remember that I checked the answer machine and she had said, I'm just calling to say that I love you and Pat. 
she said, Daddy, I love you. And for some reason, just her voice, I knew something was wrong. I remember when we got to the hospital, Jim and I went to her room. And um, she asked if I could help her get a shower. So for me, that's her surrender. My name is Jennifer Storm, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and addict. And today I'm going to share a little bit of my story with you. One of the things that they taught me in rehab was that you have to get your stuff out, right? And verbally was just not an option for me in the beginning because I, I had serious trust issues. I didn't want to talk. I wasn't going to talk about what was going on with me. So when I got clean and sober and I learned that my secrets would keep me sick, the only safe place at that time to process those secrets was, was through writing. And I learned that if I got it out in that way, then it didn't own me anymore. It didn't occupy that space in my head and it made room for healing. I, I wanted to tell my story and when it came out it gosh I got so many emails and so many letters from young girls. I think the layer that I didn't expect was all the parents who reached out to me um, and just you know thanked me for giving them a lens with which to see their own child or to at least have a fraction of understanding of what their children were going through so that maybe they could they could help. You were immediately a mother. And I know you don't realize that, or maybe you don't understand that, but like you were. It was just, it was so natural for you. Mm -hmm. um, and it was nice. It was very nice to be in a normal, safe home. Our house had ceased to be a home for yeah. years. It was just a container that we were all Place running a bucket. Yeah, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. And your home was stable and it was quiet and it was fun. I guess, you know, I just wanted to give you a nor I'll say normal life or, or a life that you should have had. And I know it was chaotic. I mean, because yeah. of your dad and the work he did and stuff like that. Yeah. So we just I just wanted you to make make you feel at home. Yeah. It was normal and mm -hmm. it was our fa it was family and we like we didn't have that. Brian, Jimmy, and I didn't have that sense of family normalcy probably from after I was raped, all that went away. In our treatment fields, we're not really making those connections between trauma and addiction. I mean, I spent 10 years running from my darkest secrets because I thought they were gonna kill me. For a long time, trauma was looked at as something that needed to be addressed after the addiction was under control. It's not working, and doing that is really setting people up to relapse because they're self-medicating those symptoms. Shame is an emotional cancer, and so once shame starts to drop away, they can start to identify who they really are. We should be looking not just at trauma-informed treatment centers and trauma-informed schools, we need to look at trauma-informed societies. I currently serve as the victim advocate for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's an appointed position by the governor. It's a six-year term confirmed by the Senate. I've done a ton of lobbying here uh, for a lot of important legislation that impacts crime victims, but we're still not getting to that root of the why. When you have an addiction as a result of your victimization, we're not fully addressing the causation of either the self-harm, the mental health issue, or the addiction. And so we're putting all these band-aids on these bullet wounds. The whole reason I want this film to be made is because there is hope and there is survival. And even in your darkest of days, beauty can find a way in, life finds a way in. Um, there's never, it's never so dark that you can't find a way out. Even though it feels that way, there are life forces that will find a way. And if there's anything that I want other survivors to know, is that it gets better. There's hope. And to not give up five minutes before that crack opens and that light comes in.